class is how to identify, analyze, and remove miasmatic blocks, multi-miasmatic blocks successfully, especially when your well-indicated remedies have not worked. So that's exactly what I'm going to help you with today. Now, if you don't know me already, I'll give you a quick introduction. So my name is Shilpa Bharaskar. I live in Sydney, Australia. I graduated as a medical doctor and worked as a homeopathic GP in India before moving to Australia in 2004. So I'm the director of the TQFS Academy and I publish training courses by world-class practitioners and trainers like Jeremy Sher and Dr. Isaac Golden, Dr. Joe Rosenwag, Dr. Ashok Borkar, Gajanan Tanipkar, um, Dr. Gansham Kalatia, you know, and you would have seen a few of these, met them through online classes. And, you know, we have members and students across almost 74 countries in the world who are learning, enriching, and developing their clinical practices and, you know, helping their clients in different corners of the world. So I'm also the author of the HomeoQuest Next Gen software that's now being used by almost 20,000 CAM practitioners and students globally to help their patients. But what is relevant to you is that I teach and mentor leading CAM practitioners and homeopathic practitioners implement clinically proven homeopathic tools in their practices. And I've helped over 1,000 multi-miasmatic, multi-layered complex cases through my Argenta mentoring portal since 2008 when we went online. So some of these patients now have followed us for over a decade. You know, we've had hundreds of follow-ups, thousands of pres prescriptions as I guide them through each follow-up to remove these blocks strategically and create these transformative healing journeys for their patients every step of the way. And what I'm teaching you today has been clinically used to help those key miasmatic blocks, help remove those key miasmatic blocks in every type of patient at every stage, you know, right from functional conditions, inflammatory, infectious, hormonal, metabolic, mental disorders, you know, to autoimmune conditions, um, multisystemic cases with gross pathologies, all through targeted multi-miasmatic remedies. Now, especially when their well-indicated remedies are blocked at various levels. So, I know you are here for getting results for your stuck cases and not just about me, right? So, let's see what you learn during this presentation. So, here's what you learn during this three-part presentation. Now, this whole presentation is built around the one-page Myasmatic Blueprint for identifying, for analyzing, and removing miasmatic blocks in multi-miasmatic, multi-layered cases. Cases where you have a lot of disease states that come together to form a complex conjoint picture. And by the time we are done, you'll be able to literally pull out this piece of blueprint. And one, you'll be able to identify the best miasmatic approach in your multi-layered case. And this is regardless of how your pa patient is presenting so I'm going to walk you through my formula that lets you identify which one of these three types of miasmatic approaches, the Hanemannian, the Kentian, the Sankarin, is suited to your case, is best suited to your case at any given point. This will also ensure that you are using the best approach to suit the exact need of your patient and his disease presentation. The second thing you learn is you'll identify the exact type of block that is most active and most dominant in your case at every step. So you can remove that. This is going to give you the confidence on where to start in these confusing cases. Because you see, you have a whole meshwork of symptoms at different layers and different, you know, core layers and all of them coming together. So I'm going to show you what exactly to do in order to find that block using each type of the miasmatic approaches. So we are looking at the three ones here, the, the Hanemanian, the Kentian and the Sankarin. 
So this will also ensure you'll never miss a miasmatic obstacle in your case. And you avoid going around in circles, losing that valuable time in your patient's healing journey. And three, we're going to learn how to choose targeted remedies to eliminate that block in the direction of healing in the quickest time so you can give your patient the breakthrough they need and they deserve. And finally, I'm going to show you how to follow up such cases and manage this unfolding through time. Remember, there's not just one block, there are many blocks and they're not going to be presenting at one time, they're going to emerge through time. So how do you identify these emerging miasmatic blocks how do you recognize that it's a mixed miasmatic states? So you can continue to eliminate them in every follow-up until this healing is sustained. And we're also going to learn how to time these remedies, you know, how to choose the potencies and what decisions you're going to make through time when you are going through this healing journey. And we're going to do that using a multi-miasmatic case example from, from my practice so you can directly implement that in your next stuck patient, right? I'm really sure you'll enjoy this because we're going to see things in practice and, you know, implement things in practice. Now, I know you've all attended miasmatic lectures before in school, in seminars, and I want to tell you how this is significantly different. So here's why this presentation and this course is going to be very different than what you've done in the past. One, this is all born from actual patient implementation of my miasm blueprint in tens of thousands of multi-miasmatic cases in my own practice in the last 20 years and in my Argentum students' practices on patients at different stages of development of their disease conditions. And that is what is so critical because any contemporary practice that uses homeopathy lives and dies by this important piece of information. There is no theory in this. It's all just pure practical application based on all those patients who have been stagnated and stuck even after using well-indicated medicines. And these miasmatic tools have helped unlock and move them dramatically forward to a state where your indicated medicines will start working again. And so you can complete that resolution process. So remember, most practitioners can resolve a single disease state with your known constitutional remedies. And if, if your disease is functional, then your well-indicated constitutional medicine will generally cover the miasm. And so you can un unfold the entire case, sometimes miraculously with that one remedy. But what you're learning today is how to work on those cases where there are like multiple disease states across various systems in your body and they all go and create this complex multi-layered case. Now they cannot be covered with one remedy. It's, you know, highly impossible to do that. Why? Because there are a series of suppressions that create miasmatic blocks and independent pathological states and all of them enmesh together. I always give the example of a play-doh with different colors and it's all come together as one complex mesh and now start you know picking each color as a different state and trying and you know separating out. That is what the problem is. So you have this sort of a case with multiple layers and multiple disease states and multiple miasms, you know, inherited miasms, acquired miasms, fundamental miasms, they're all superimposed on one another. That is the issue here. So you cannot form one single totality. You cannot have a remedy that really covers it all. You need to strategically find one dominant state, the tip of the iceberg, you know, to start that unfolding process. And then as you go forward, you will need a series of remedies, you know, miasmatic remedies, indicated remedies to unfold the other emerging layers. 
and this is where most of your patients will present to you today in real clinics you know so unless you are like a hobbyist homeopath or a lay person or you're simply you know dipping your toes in water this is what will be you know your practice all about now this approach is not just about homeopaths it is also working outside the homeopathic world what i'm going to show you has been used by a huge number of camp practitioners from all types of modalities and i say it from my own experience you know naturopaths herbalists aesthetologists osteopaths chiropractors even conventional gps dentists they're using these myosmetic remedies in my mentoring program when their indicated remedies or modalities are stagnated so you do not need to be highly experienced in homeopathy to use these tools so why is this important to you right now why is learning this complex you know case analysis with multi-layered states so critical for you at this point in time I'll give you two main reasons why you need to learn, know this. First, practitioners and students have been so bombarded with conflicting information on myisms that it has led to immense frustration, overwhelm and confusion, including me when I started. So you're not alone. And it has led many people to believe that this is all theory and there is no real practical value in understanding the myisms. So they either think it's too hard and they give up. And so most people will not use myismatic tools in their practice or they won't consciously look for them. Now what happens is unfortunately most of these practitioners will end up with a lot of stuck cases that will go around in circles in spite of the best approaches and remedies and unfortunately these patients would leave them so in spite of doing the best they are losing on these valuable clients and then they try changing those remedies or changing those potencies and in the end they lose these clients when all they would have needed was just a simple blockbuster and that is why I just feel it's so critical that every homeopath who is, you know, in here and committed to really do well in practice needs to know this. The second reason is most people who think they use myisms, they only focus on one approach. So you could be either using one of the three myismatic approaches and either a Kenton one or a Sankaran's one or a Hahnemann's myism for every case that you get right and that does not work for all patients remember not all myismatic approaches work the same for all patients in every step of the disease progress each approach is suited and works in a specific type of patient and their disease expressions and we are going to fix that today so you know exactly what tool to use in what cases to get the most dramatic unfolding. So remember, myisms are such a crucial part of any successful contemporary practice. And if you can apply these wells, it will revolutionize your practice as it did to homeopathy itself. You know, when Hahnemann discovered them for the very first time, it changed the entire core potential and scope of homeopathy. And it has continued to take homeopathy to new levels as Kenton myisms came into picture and later Sankaran's myisms were discovered. And I know people are skeptical about this, but just hold your disbelief for a moment and, you know, check this out. Today, the game has changed. The myismatic landscape today is significantly different than what it was even a decade ago. So we have a lot of contemporary myisms in each, contem in each myismatic approach that has expanded the approach tremendously. But there is good news because we don't have to be overwhelmed by all these tools. We can now strategically engineer our success. We have a blueprint 
to guide us. And we know how to use it for the right patient at the right time through their disease journey by using the best of all these three tools. So this will act powerfully to unlock at least 90% of our stuck cases. And you can build that tremendous momentum in your clients and in your practice. Regardless of experience and regardless of the type of patient you see. And we are going to learn how to do it together in this training. First, I want to clear this if this is for you. Out of respect for your time, I want to share who this is for and who this is not for. So, you know, you can be here and you can really get the best out of this presentation. One, if you are an experienced professional practitioner who is using myisms already and you want to you have a big boost in your response to those tools, this is for you. How? Possibly you're using just one type of myismatic approach and you're doing that pretty well. And now you want to do better. You want to expand the scope of homeopathy for cases where this approach does not work. And this training is going to show you the gaps and open the entire spectrum of tools for you so you can expand your patient base and create that breakthrough in more patients than you already are doing. Now, if you're a student and a beginner who are, who's new to myisms and you want to jumpstart your success from day one of your practice, this is definitely for you. So you don't want to go through trial and error. You don't want, you know, to get your patient around in circles. You want to get your patients moving from day one, consult one in the right direction. You don't want to start slowly and, you know, you want to kickstart your practice right away this is your presentation this is you know the course for you and finally if you are a camp practitioner and you have been led to believe that myisms are only for experienced practitioners and homeopaths and you were told to stick with first aid remedies and acutes this is definitely for you i mean most of my argentum students who make the use of myismatic tools are naturopaths they are herbalists they're conventional doctors they're dentists and they use these tools to resolve some of their most challenging you know multi-systemic pathological cases when their indicated modalities are stuck using simple and powerful Hahnemann in myisms the Hahnemann in myisms have changed the trajectory of the potential of homeopathy for our cases today why? Because it's the most simple and the most powerful tool for some of our most challenging pathological cases. And your success rate will take a huge boost in these conditions if only you know this one single tool. So if you want to consistently unblock your stuck cases and create a series of transformative journeys for your clients, then these myismatic tools are going to be awesome for you. So here is who this is not for. If you're looking for quick fixes in homeopathy, and if you get want to get those miracles with one single remedy, sorry, this is not for you. This is for patients and students who want to learn how to clear those multisystemic states you know, through a series of prescriptions to get that transformation because you cannot have one single remedy covering it all. And if you just want to use first aid homeopathy for friends and family, you're looking for just one-off prescriptions, then sorry, this is not for you. It's for committed homeopaths who want to learn how to work with chronic, you know, cases that have been developed over years. Now, I have to give you a confession here. I have an advantage over most because I trained in a medical school in India. I learned with the best homeopathic teachers on earth, arguably. I've observed and worked with thousands of patients even before I graduated from medical school in those five and a half years in various hospitals, in conventional hospitals and homeopathic hospitals. So you would think I already had a head start over most people 
to unblock these stuck cases using the Myasmetic approach. And so far, I have helped over 10,000 challenging cases in my own practice, and I continue to do that 24-7 in my students' practices, especially in Argentum through those multi-layered, multi-myasmetic pathological states. But let me tell you a secret. 80% of the success today in my multi-myasmetic cases is not due to the approach I learned in my medical school. I know it is shocking, but it's true. So in my third year of medical school, that was the first time we were trained on how to use the myasmetic approach for our patients. And I observed that while this approach worked dramatically well in certain cases, it failed miserably in most others. So one day, I decided to dive into the Hahnemann's chronic diseases because that was the source book. And that, I did that for the very first time, I think after a few months of having been trained in, in classes. And to say that I was completely overwhelmed by that book would be an understatement. And we all know how Hahnemann writes, right? If you can pick up the gems, that's great. But more importantly, what dumbfounded me was the fact that what Hahnemann wrote about myasms in chronic diseases was completely different to what was being taught in my classes. So after a lot of questions, eventually I realized that we were actually being taught the Kenton myasms. Nothing wrong with that, but it was very important for me to clarify what was actually going on. And then things even got more confusing in my final year, because now I could see that there was yet another emerging way, the Sankaran's way, when I attended Dr. Sankaran's OPD and was learning around, you know, with him. And his concept on myism seemed to be completely coming from a different planet. Now, as if it was not enough that we had dozens of approaches and metho methodologies on homeopathy, we now had conflicting myismatic approaches to add on to the ongoing chaos in our brains as students. And I was trying to make sense of everything in the best way I could. And for a long time, I was, you know, during my training and even in my early practice, I, know I was simply lost within the so-called miasmatic maze. So I had two options, you know, abandon everything and just forget about them. Or second, figure this out and find answers to all my frustrating questions and my cases that were going around in circles. And that was the most life-changing decision of my homeopathic journey. I decided to figure this whole landscape out, this whole miasmatic you know, spectrum out, because no one has become a success by being a quitter. Deeply, I knew miasms were the key. It dramatically changed homeopathy and its scope for Hahnemann. Hahnemann did not li live in vain for 12 years, studying cases, you know, in chronological order before he wrote chronic diseases. So I knew I had to figure this out. And so I modeled him and I started studying cases where each of these miasmatic tools were used. So cases where Hahnemann's myasms were used, cases where Kenton myasms were used, and cases where Sankaran's myasms were used. And it was not until I discovered the stages template during my early practice that I started putting together the missing pieces of this miasmatic blueprint together. And the stages template was a game changer for me, not just to pick the right approach 
for my patients. But now to pick the right miasmatic tool powerfully. And now suddenly the value of each miasmatic approach became crystal clear. And it, I soon realized that each of these miasmatic tools, you know, the Sankrans, the Hanumanian, the Kentin, was a perfect fit for a specific stage and a specific patient and a disease state. And that for me was a light bulb moment. It was the secret to success using miasms, was simply finding the right miasmatic tool to suit the exact stage your patient was at. And I could see all my failures in practice in miasms were when I tried to use a tool that was not suited to the approach. And this completely changed the trajectory of my success in challenging multi-layered, multi-state complex cases around across the spectrum. So my clinical success took a leap three times, you know, to be precise, because now I was using three different types of tools. So there were three different types of patients and, you know, that audience. I could confidently unlock highly challenging cases, multi mathematic complex cases, right from stage one to stage four, because I could choose one of the three tools suited to each stage. And this course, I will explain to you how you can go around that. What do you need to do? In what sequence you go? And this whole process of the miasmatic blueprint. So I will take you through that. And I'm going to show you how to get your patients to complete their healing journey and how to make sure they keep progressing. And remember, it is not hard to master these things. And you will see how in this course. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through that process through one case example of a multi medic case I saw in 2009. And there were, you know, there were so many cases I was spoiled for choice, but I decided to choose this multi medic case because I think this is something which is a very common presentation in most clinics. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the entire clinical journey, right from that first to the last consultation. And I'm promising you it will give you a ready to use process and you should be able to create a successful outcome for your patients too, using this template. Now, you don't have to do that just with one patient, you can do that in patient after patient. And you can build a fulfilling business and a practice because this is the exact process I follow in majority of my multi medic patients. This is a typical scenario you will see. So the tools will change, the approaches will change, the remedies will change, but remember the baseline process will remain the same. And all you need to do is just start applying that. The other thing is when you go from one consultation to the other, remember you're building more and more momentum in your practice. You know, your patients look forward to coming back because they are seeing a change in every session. And that's how you're going to create that great practice through homeopathy. And that's what is going to give you the satisfaction of seeing your prescriptions work and creating the impact that you want and that you deserve as a practitioner. So with that said, let's go. Okay, so we're going to see a case and we're going to see a, the stages miasmatic blueprint implemented through this multi-layered multi miasmatic case. All right, and this is our first consult. So we have a 57 year old female who comes to us and she filled up my questionnaire and I found that she had a long list of presenting complaints. You know, there were at least 10, 15, you know, different complaints all happening at the same time. And here are some of the main ones. 
You know, she had recurrent urinary tract infections since a long, long time. And doctors had diagnosed it as interstitial cystitis. She had possibly polyps in her urethra, so she was cauterized a few times. She's had episodes of acute interstitial nephritis, which was a pretty intense thing. Then she also had irritable bowel syndrome. She had fistula in anus. Um, she's had a lot of polyps removed. So there were at least four colonoscopies done in the recent past. Now, when I saw her in that consultation for the very first time, I, you know, she looked very drained and she was diagnosed with glandular fever and it was followed by chronic fatigue since the age of 37. So she's had this for 20 years now. And she'd gone to multiple doctors, multiple practitioners, and nothing had worked for her. You know, she was basically at her wit's end. Now, she's, she was seeing, you know, a lot of homeopathic practitioners for a number of years, but none of the treatment had worked for her. She had a particular naturopath in Adelaide from where she came. And, you know, she gave her lots of complex homeopathic mixtures, biometric products, tonics you know she developed some side effects to some of these products and you know so when she moved to sydney she saw a classical homeopath and this homeopath has also given her tons of homeopathics and she could remember a few that helped her to some extent but nothing worked for a long time so there was lycopodium she said there was calcutta florica and whatnot so she said, I've given him so many weeks and months and I'm worse than before. And he said, I'm a difficult patient. So, you know, she lost confidence in herself. She lost confidence in him. And she said, you know, I feel as at rock bottom. I have everything similar to what when she had glandular fever for the very first time. So in that first con consult she spoke about these constant urinary tract infections this constant desire to urinate at all the time you know night and day and she says I feel very thirsty I drink a lot of water and yet I feel dehydrated you know I have low BP it's all very weird so I don't know really what's going on she says I have salty taste in my mouth all the time I'm constantly exhausted with muscle aches, with that chronic fatigue. You know, she has cramps in her feet, toes. And she's a very cold person, very sensitive to cold. You know, actually, when I saw her in the room, she was literally shivering. And the temperature in the room was at least 20 degrees. But she was, you know, sitting there all crunched up from head to toe. And she says, I can't find comfortable shoes because my feet ache all the time. And she was on tonics for her gut and nutrients for that. And she said, you know, my whole body is not in a good space. I've booked in my GP next Friday because she wants to know what's going wrong again. And this is not the first time she's seeing her GP. So she said, I hope he runs some more tests. Now, a physio is working on her all the time uh, with on her core strength. And the reason for that is she's had an accident and she's injured herself. Uh, and that's the reason he's working on her. And she says, I've put on a lot of weight since then. And so she's really hoping the GP will do some tests and find out what's wrong with me. She said, I'm stiff all the time. I'm locked up every day. I wake up stiff and I loosen up through the day. And then she goes to bed and she wakes up stiff again. So the cycle repeats. You know, she says, I've got an expensive mattress with my sleep number. So, you know, these, these mattresses where they find out what your sleep number is and what's the most comfortable for you uh, based on your condition. But, you know, nothing is helping her. Now, she gave a past history and there were a few important things, you know, which were for me 
you know, chronologically, it's always important to get the past history when your patients come in because, uh, you know, that history will tell you a lot about their myosomes. So she had severe acidity since birth. Doctors wanted to open my esophagus, but my mom won't allow it. And she said because of the high acid secretions, my first teeth were all rotten. All the enamel was destroyed due to the acids. Then from six weeks to six months, she had um, multiple episodes of appendicitis. And then at the age of four, she had tonsillitis and I think her tonsils were removed. And then she's had multiple infections as a child, uh, chicken pox, mumps, measles. And then further on, at the age of 37, she developed glandular fever. And it was followed by years and years of chronic fatigue. And then later on, you know, she had recurrent urinary tract infections and the doctors diagnosed that as interstitial cystitis. Then her urethra was cauterized because she started growing polyps. And then she had an episode of acute interstitial nephritis, which was a bit alarming for her. And then later on, she's had fistula in anus. She's had almost four colonoscopies and polyps removed. And, and then she's recently had the, this car accident where she had a head trauma, a twisted ankle, she torn a few tendons and the knee meniscus, and she's undergone surgery. So she's now on regular physiotherapy since. So it's been a lot and there has been quite, you know, she's been sick for a long time now. And then she got all the current treatments that she was taking. And I had a full page, lists of tonics and antacids and, you know, homeopathic combinations sold by the naturopath. And then obviously she had the physiotherapy exercises regime for her core strength and flexibility. Now, when I went into the mental state, she's had a lot of deaths in the family. So I could sense there was a lot of sadness and grief. And she described, you know, who the family members were. There were quite a few pets she's had, you know, horses and cats and dogs. And uh, a cat had recently died. But she was very vague, you know. It was as if she was disconnected from that grief. She was lost and, you know, she lost the thread of what she was saying at times. She was repeating the same things again and again. And she was never going deeper. She was just going around in circles. So the question now is, what will you do now? You know, we have something where you have a lot of information. Uh, however, is it enough? And what is it that you do with this information? Do we dive in and get the mental state and dig into her state and find her constitutional, which is probably buried down? Or do we, what, what do we do now? So remember, first and foremost, you have to understand what is the stage of this case? And I would call it a stage one and two. Because yes, there were um, disease symptoms, but we have no peculiars. There's nothing, you know. She doesn't give you any interesting peculiars. She talks about a, a sadness and grief, and that's it in her mental state. Um, so basically, this is more stage one than two, uh, because there are no sensations, there are no modalities as such, which I can really look at, you know, just the list of symptoms and going around in circles. She, so we call this a complex conjoint case because she did start talking about some of her constitutional aspects when she was talking about the mental state and, you know, lots of deaths in the family and divorce of her parents. But it didn't have, you know, it, there was nothing beyond that. And then you have loads of things happening in the last, you know, 50 years of her life. And, and this was how this complex conjoint case is formed. This is exactly what a conjoint case, multiple diseases across multiple systems, myriad of symptoms, physical, mental, common, no peculiars here. 
multiple suppressions. Remember, she's been on antibiotics, antacids, proton pump inhibitors. Um, she's had tonics and she's taking something every day for months. Then she's had surgical cauterization and suppression at that level, multiple polyps removed in the past. So this is where you look for the Hanneman and myasmatic approach. And I'll tell you what is very critical when you're looking at this approach. You have to trace a clear not pain well since syndrome. It could be an infective agent. It could be uh, a poisoning. It could be uh, you know, such a, like a heavy metal poisoning or something. It could be a trauma or a shock. It could be some sort of suppression in some way. So something that holds the presenting problem, which is what she comes for, which is these chronic urinary state, you know, infections, the cystitis, the kidney infections. This is, the, this is where she wants your help from. She's urinating every few hours. She's dehydrated. She's thirsty. And this tiredness and muscle aches and, you know, sensitivity, all this is the state we have to find where did it all start and what we realize so Hanneman spoke about just three myasms the sora the psychosis syphilis but there have been a lot of other contemporary myasms that have come up um, thanks to Burnett and a lot of other homeopaths have done really grounded work on the Hanneman's approach here so this is a contemporary approach here because we don't have any sora psychosis or syphilis right here where she's had a, a either uh, you know scabies or gonorrhea or syphilitic uh, infection so we're looking at a contemporary myism here and what i found was she's not been well since glandular fever which happened 20 years back now let me show you how i study the state of not been well since I look for three states. I look for, and when you, I'm, I'm studying a disease uh, and I look at the pathophysiology, I divide it into three parts, the active part, the latent part, and the chronic part. Now in homeopathy, in myasms, you are very interested in the chronic part because the active goes away in a few days or a week, right? So this is as soon as, you know, the person is infected in the acute state. He has fatigue in granular fever. You, if you read the physiology, the pathophysiology, check out any, um, you know, you can look at lots of websites as well as books and you find there is fatigue, there's fever, there is inflamed throat, swollen lymph nodes, enlarged spleen, enlarged liver and rash, right? Now, in the latent state, so this is the Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, you have a chronic fatigue that develops and goes on for people uh, for months and years. Okay, so now most of people, uh, and she's definitely showing a latent state, but later on, this is very important what happens in the chronic state. This is something you won't, you have to dig a lot in um, and do a bit more research to find the chronic state because it's a rare thing, but for homeopaths, it is the thing. And when uh, there were three or four different websites where I found this information that chronic fatigue, oh, sorry, Epstein-Barr virus, chronic mononucleosis is linked to seven autoimmune diseases, systemic lupus erythromatosis, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, and type 1 diabetes. So this is also not been well since syndrome so if you have a patient who has all these things one of these things leading not been well since glandular fever most doctors won't connect them this is research that tells you and then i found two important articles where it mentioned persistent bladder inflammation in human interstitial cystitis and acute interstitial nephritis so check this here monovirus linked to seven serious diseases uh, and those were the ones they found that in, you know, Cincinnati Children's Report that the EBV can cause severe issues in some people. And then I found this article where Epstein-Barr is a potential etiology of persistent bladder inflammation in human interstitial cystitis, which is exactly what she had. And then there was this interesting article where 
people develop acute nephritis. And one of the most common medicines that really implicated this was proton pump inhibitors, which she was all also taking. So that tells you a lot about what's happening here. So she was given glandular fever nosod in a 200C. And this is what we got in the follow-ups. She took the medicine for four days. Now, the reason I gave her 200C, because she had very strong symptoms, quite clear symptoms of the nosod, um, you know, along, you know, the whole excess. So I thought 200C was a good potency to use for her. Generally, for me, nosod start with 30C, and that is the lowest you can use. So nosodes, when I'm using them, I use in higher potencies. Um, and 200 is a moderate sort of potency for a nosod. She says, I took the medicine for four days. So I took, told her to take, you know, day one, day two, day three, and then stop. And if required, day four. So she says, I'm much better. She says, my energy is much better. The digestion is still not okay. But the aches in the joints are gone. Um, she says, my thirst is very much better. The urination is much better. I'm not going at all at night, uh, but I'm going through the day. But she said, thank God you nailed it. And I was really surprised because, you know, the extent of the shift that happened with the GFN was surprising to me because it was a relatively new remedy. In fact, this was my very first GFN prescription. Uh, and I've used this remedy so many times, hundreds of prescriptions since then. But that was my first one. So, and you know, I was a bit guilty and not given a proper constitutional, right? So you you'd sort of think you've not really not done much. But this is the beauty of the Hanuman's miasms, is that, you know, I want to spell it out again. The Hanuman's miasm is an incredible tool. If you know and you have the information at stage one and two, then you have a history of heavy suppression and your core so-called constitutional state is masked, this is your go-to tool. And if you're like me, when I was a big nor and guilty of not giving a constitutional, remember you cannot do that in such cases. It is submerged, it's buried acquired layers and you have to deal with the most presenting state and layer and in this case it was the glandular fever okay so now the question is what next so when a first prescription registers the idea is to wait and watch and get the best out of your first prescription until it stagnates or a new totality emerges now remember this case has been she's not been well since birth you know so this is like a 50, 55 year disease evolution. And we've just started to work on a key layer created in the last 20 years. And we'll be discussing the next phase and the next follow-up in the, in the next session. But I have to tell you something about Hanumanian miasmatic tools. And you must have known this is my default approach. If my patient with a history of suppression and there is a specific block of a not been well seen syndrome, a disease block. And the trick is you need to know the pathophysiology of the disease process correctly, right? You can't just go on past history because sometimes you may not have a past history of in suppressed infection, but you can still have an infective state right so you should know the drug picture the disease pictures of the key infections the material medica of those known sorts really well and that's the reason i'm going to go through these pictures and these remedies in great detail in my Hanuman and miasmatic blueprint course right but when you've got your outcome using a Hanuman and miasmatic approach it just gives you a great positioning for your patients i mean you are helping in those cases when not many practitioners can and you are helping those complex cases without going into any complexity of the homeopathic approaches how cool is that i mean and you're building that goodwill you're building a relationship with your patients and you cannot underestimate how powerful it is it seems very simple and that's the beauty of these miasmatic tools is they are so simple that it's unbelievable and the amount of impact they create 
to take your patient to the next level. So they will come back when they are ready for the next stage. And I promise this tool will get you started in your first consult with that confidence, right? So I use this approach ex exclusively uh, to help my Argentum students in their cases during that first consult when these cases are stuck, right? So because that's how you build your case momentum. That's how you build your skills and then you start expanding and you start gaining confidence of using other approaches and other stages as you evolve. So this is the essence of how you grow as a practitioner yourself. And it's a very flexible approach and this is the potential that you could offer. So I know you could be in three categories. And you know you could be an experienced homeopathic practitioner, great at using your classical tools, then in that case, this approach could help you unfold a patient where you cannot use those classical constitutional remedies, especially if the core is lost or masked or suppressed, like in this case. This is your key tool. If you're a CAM practitioner who has an existing patient who is doing well on your baseline modalities and suddenly it stops working for them, or you have you know, patients who show a new layer or a new disease layer from some of the past suppressions and they start spiraling downhill. This is the approach that will help you unblock and your baseline modalities will start working again. And if you're a student starting from scratch and you have a new case where you do not have enough peculiars you know, to get a constitutional remedy or even an indicated remedy, this is when I see students start throwing remedies and desperations, you know, acutes and therapeutics. You know, you don't have to do that. You, you don't get anywhere doing, using those remedies and desperation. This is where, you know, you have to give that deep unblocking process for your patient. And even if you don't get anywhere after this process, you know, you have given your patient the outcome that they need. Your patient is more than happy with what you've done in that first consultation. And you've done much better than so many other conventional practitioners, you know, they could have visited. So that's so why I'm so passionate about the handyman approach. I mean, this approach will give you a breakthrough that's almost miraculous sometimes, right? So I can't hear to wait um, and hear your stories on how will you use the handyman and myasmatic approach in your practice. And right now, if you like this session, Please hit the like button down because it's nice to know that, you know, this is making sense for you and it's worthwhile making these videos for you. So I would love to know your key learning from this session. All right. I would like to know what did you get from this session? What more would you want from the next session? And then in the next session, we are going to go through the next phase of this patient's journey. Remember, I promise you're going to love it. And we're going to see what new layers emerge and what do you do next. All right. So until then, I look forward to your inputs. Take care.